You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. I literally had like 200 pounds in the bank. So like 20 and oh, 19 KOs, British champion, I had a fight on, on ITV. I didn't even know the purse. I had a fight with uh, Steve Collins. Uh, Steve Collins was the champion and um, he sort of, uh, he didn't fancy the fight, you know. I, I, he said he was injured. There's a couple of reasons, but yeah, I understand why he didn't. You know, obviously he was he was in big fights with uh, Eubank and Ben, and obviously he's fighting this young kid that's not already got a massive name. Twenty knockouts in twenty one fights, is it worth the gamble? But then stepped uh, Chris Eubank, who, um, if anything, I was more wary of with the Eubank because he's one of them guys that when his back's against the wall, he's a dangerous dangerous fucking animal. I spoke to HBO. This is like at, at the, the press room. And Hopkins was at the press room, and um, yeah, I, I just I sort of visualised. I remember going in there. I could see him coming there. I fucking see him making his way with his little entourage there, and that's when he says in beautiful words, "I I've never let a white boy beat me." <laughs> but I, um, I remember going there into the Madison Square Garden in the afternoon when they just put the ring together. And I was just looking around, thinking, "Fucking, this is it, man. This is my last fight." So it's, uh, it's a lot of shock, you know. My dad was. Yeah, uh, unbelievably fit. Um, he had a few illnesses, and it, yeah, it was, uh, it was a shock, man. It's uh, it's one of the things. It's it's still hard to believe. You know, I lost my dad in September 2018, and just you know, just fucking missed every day. You know, just uh, it's hard. And I lost my mum like 16 months later. You know, it's. You know, you think boxing's tough, but fucking real life is really tough. But, you know, God tests us all, as my dad used to say. Boom, we're on. <laughs> Today's guest, we've got undefeated fighter Joe Kozagi. Joe, absolute honor, uh, honestly. Pleased to meet you, man. Sitting across from an absolute legend, one of the greatest boxers of all time. Thank you, bro. Undisputed super middleweight. You held all the belts. Unbelievable achievement. It's honestly buzzing to be sitting across from you. Yeah, massive, thank massive you. Massive fan for yeah. years. How have you been, it. brother? Yeah, it's been it's been all right. It's been good. Yeah. You know, it's a long time ago, isn't it? It's, it's mad how, how quick time goes when you're retired, to be honest, you know. But uh, what can I say, you know, uh, to achieve what I've achieved, you know, um, with, my, with my father, you know, remember my dad Enzo, you know, uh, it's amazing. What a, what a career. 46, you know, like I say, one of the greatest of all time. You're up there with your Floyd Mayweathers, your Rocky Marcianos. Like, that's a, I don't think people realise how big, I, I, true boxers do, the, what you went through and what you achieved. It's nothing short of, I don't even have a word for it, but <laughs> it's um, unbelievable. Two-weight world champion, kid from Wales, just Came through the ranks, some massive fights. Chris Eubank, you've got Hopkins, Jones, the man there in the back. Kessler, is yeah, in. Jeff Lacey, also big, <laughs> big fights. Big fights, but you know, I didn't get them uh, big fights, you know, to sort of to the end of my career, you know what I mean? So um, it was a long, long time, a lot of injury problems, you know, uh, I started boxing um, as a nine year old, you know? Um, I still remember the first time my dad took us to the gym. Not this, this is a plus gym. I mean, mm -hmm. about two miles away, it's, uh, it was like a, a, sh a shed, it was made of tin. And um, basically that, that was where I started. But um, yeah, it was a, a trainer called Paul Williams at the time, who was, who was, a, he was called Newbridge Jam in the Boxing Club, Newbridge ABC. So, you know, he took me in to the gym. And um, yeah, I, I would say that I loved it straight away, but I actually was a, I love playing football as well. My dad being um, from Sardinia, um, it basically, obviously, you know, I went to football under 10s, went to the boxing gym. I used to skip the boxing gym when my dad was doing music he's a musician and go to the football. But yeah, um, and my first fight as a 10 year old. A lot of people don't know this. I actually lost my first fight. Lost my first ever fight. His name was Chris Stock. You remember him as well? <laughs> Chris Stock. I'll tell you my story. Right? So my first ever fight, 10 year old, in the like a workman's club, smoky workman's club. And all I remember was was when they said he won on the majority decision, split decision. 
I just remember having my hands like this and, and crying. And the, the trainer was Paul Lims at the time, the, the first coach, uh, to take me out of there. And I remember the, how horrible that felt, um, losing, do you know what I mean? So I lost my first ever fight. I must start, I beat him six times afterwards. <laughs> Throw that in there, Rajo. And not just that, but his father was one of the judges. That's not fair, <laughs> right? But um, yeah, so it's mad that um, just go to show you. I wasn't, uh, you know, a natural from the start, you know, it was hard work and uh, that's that's what happened, you know, um, start winning a few, losing a few, but uh, it all come together when I was uh, uh, 12. So I was started rededicating myself, realized I was never gonna be Roberto Baggio of the world, okay? So I started really focusing, and I was, things were starting to click. I mean, my dad was training me every day of the week. You know, he used to kick my ass every day of the week. No, no, no messing around. He'd, like, I'd come home from school and it rain, sleet or snow, he'd, he'd make sure i go for a run. Even if I didn't want to go for a run. At 12? Yeah, he had, he had a struggle for weight there. It was 36 kilograms. So I had a little bit of a growth space. I won the watch title, boxed in the, the ABAs. And like I said, I won the fastest win of the tournament. I boxed a boy called Ian Raby from London. So remember, I won in the first round. Forgot my boxing boots, so I was the only person <laughs> to wear trainers in that fight. So, uh, yeah, it was, um, that was it. As soon as I won that first ABA title, 1985, and um, that was it. I, the feeling of being a winner, it was like, wow, you know, I, I, this is what I want to do for for, for a living and, and, and to be a world champion one day. It was my dream, and thank God there, my father, you know, who believed in me, truly believed in me and give me that, that mindset that you are going to be world champion one day. Even through injuries, like I got told I wasn't going to box again when I was 17, 18, you know, with a wrist injury and so on. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Kept, yeah. kept pushing and kept pushing and kept, kept having the faith I'd do it. So your dad's background was from Italy, your mum was from Wales, and your dad, how, what was that story? How did they two connect? Yeah, so um, basically uh, my grandfather after the war, like a lot of Italian immigrants moved to Bedford, uh, so my dad, sort of at the age of, uh, I think about four, five, him and his brothers and sister, they basically moved to, to Bedford. And um, my, my granddad worked really hard in the stonemasons, I think, and he was also a chef. And so my dad was brought up like as, as English, if you know, so his English was his first language, right? So he came up as a kid. And I think when he was around 14, 15, my grandfather, they, they owned their own house, which was the first in the Italian community, only because they used to work no, it's not my granddad, you know, um, no, no, Giuseppe, who I'm named after, right? Amazing guy, amazing, um, you know, I miss him. And um, yeah, they moved back, but my father was, uh, went back to Sardinia, and he went to national service. So in national service, he played, he was a really good footballer, my dad, right? So played national service, he played with a guy called Nicolai, who played for Juve, Juventus, good footballer, very quick winger, and he wanted to be a footballer. But um, there's a lot of music in the family on my, my grandfather's wife. So my nan's side, Porodu's side, he's a musician. He's still alive with my Zio Vincenzo, right? Franco Vincenzo, who my name, dad was named after. So my grandfather just basically said, you can't play football, you're gonna have to play music. So he taught him how to play the bass. And then was, and that was the end. So as soon as he done his first gig, discovered women and alcohol and the football was <laughs> fucked off, right? So my dad wanted to be a musician. He grew his hair long mm -hmm. and everything. Um, you know, loved the Beatles, you know, loved music, but in Sardinia, he just didn't fit in. And he, he missed going back, he missed England. You know, he loved the Beatles, he missed England. So the story is like, so basically my dad wanted to move. Um, what he did, um, he basically uh, went, uh, the story is he got my dad, my no, 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 my granddad was in work. He got up, he called up in Sassari where he was from. So he got, got a lamppost, called for the window, got his passport and a few quid he had. He got his guitar on his back and he just left. He, he left, um, he hitchhiked his way around Europe. He spent time in Amsterdam, um, um, slept on the bridges, just, 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 uh, just, just, just busking his way around Europe, wanting to get back to England. And the uh, story is that um, he come to, to Bedford to meet my auntie Janina. Thank, thankfully for me, she just went back to Sardinia. Um, so he's going to hitchhike back to, to Italy because he had nowhere to stay. And as it happened, he, uh, <laughs> he bought a big bottle of uh, VAT 2020, right? Got pissed, right? 
Gone, uh, got the wrong side of the road, and as he went back to La Havre, so he went from over to La Havre, La Havre, wrong side of the road, and then ended up back in England. So he woke up next to him, like, what the fuck, I'm back, I'm back in England. <laughs> so he went back to Bournemouth with which one of his friends, and cut long story short, he said, uh, he's going to Wales. So he had a mate that knew somebody in Wales, and I'm not sure some girl in Wales or whatever. So cut long story short, he went, he went to Wales. Um, my dad uh, was in, in Cardiff, and he had no money, even for a cup of coffee, right? So he went, he went into the Wimpy where my mum was 17 and was working in the Wimpy. So the stories my mum used to say, like, he went in and he asked for a cup of tea and, she's, and she went to get a cup, no, no, I mean coffee, tea. And my mum wouldn't serve him. So she said, this guy's taking a piss. This, <laughs> he, can you serve him? Because I'm shy. That was usually 16, so but that would have been about 19. And um, and that was that. And uh, basically, he waited for my mum, and uh, he was pissing down in the rain outside. He waited for my mum to come out. And my mum, because she worked at Wimby, was like free burgers. And my dad was starving, and he was like, oh, can I get out of a bun of your burgers? And my mum gave him one of the burgers. And what can he say? You know, they sort of, um, I think, went to, went somewhere to a, like, for a drink or to disc, some disco, that was some free disc or whatever. And uh, yeah, they sort of, connected thanks to me oh thank god and um what happened then is um they got together then they decided to go to london where my my mum worked at 20th century fox uh, my dad still trying to do music and so on and uh worked there as well and i was born in hammersmith and so i was born in hammersmith london and then from hammersmith they went to sardinia um hitchhiked to sardinia um, we have to edit that one because that's before the story mixed up a bit. So they went to Sardinia. Yeah, did they check the Sardinia? They went, anyway, they went to Sardinia. No, on the train, sorry. So they edge on the train to Sardinia. Uh, I would live there for about, I think, about 12 months. And then my mum missed home because she's from South Wales. Uh, not far from South Wales, a place called Trudiga. And um, yeah, they come back. And that's it. You know, I was sort of settled with my, my grandmother. On my my mum's mum, um, in a place called Markham, it's not far from here. And then yeah, we uh, we sort of had a, a house there, a council house. It was a council estate called Pen Penramo, and uh, that's where that's where they settled. And, and that's where uh, yeah, the biggest story. Is. So yeah, it's about a gypsy right. lifestyle, with that, and yeah, Bus yeah, yeah but, homeless. But you know what? I used to like my dad. You know, like I say, he was a musician at the bank with Fon Legion with my uncle Lucio, my uncle Sergio, and um, they actually had a record contract. They they sort of uh, gig with Paul Young, um, Baron Knights, a band that managed my my, um, my dad. So I used to hitchhike. I used to love it. I used to fucking love it, man. In the eighties, I was fourteen, and I used to hitchhike from because they were based in Milton Keynes, right? So the story is, my, my mum didn't want to go to Milton Keynes, and they were on the verge of like spinning up at the time. And thankfully for me, because I was going to leave where I am here to go to Milton Keynes, and my mum stopped the keys and there was a place called Lakes Estate, which, uh, you know, my, my, it's not my, there's no boxing gyms there. Put it that way, I don't know what, what would have happened to me, but I wouldn't have been a, a boxer. Isn't know? it mad how all the stars aligned for where you end up in life, like from your dad busking, traveling all through Europe, just searching, ends up in Wales. Meeting a woman, fucking, basically running away to Sardinia, busking, homeless again, hitchhiking. Yeah. Like, Ain't life mad? It is mad. It still puzzles me. Like I'm a weird thinker. Like yeah. I can look up at the stars and I just think, what the fuck is going on out there? Like know. it's just life is mad. And to then all that and then for your careers, again, it's unbelievable. But when you going through school and as well, Joe, you had a tough time with bullies and stuff. Yeah, because I know you wanted to play football and. Was that one of the reasons why you changed from football to boxing to then defend yourself? No, against no, no, not at all. And believe it or not, I was ABA champion, but I was only small, like five from ten. And uh, the, the comprehensive school I went to was outside my catchment area. And it was really strange. It was like one day, at the year three, I was like 40, I went to school. And it was like everybody was ganging up on me. It was like people I thought my friends was my friends. And I thought sometimes name calling. It wasn't like physical, it was like name calling. Mental abuse. Yeah. You know, that's really tough when you're young. And I always remember there's like about 30 kids come up to my house. I still remember on bikes and I was going to fight this one boy. So my dad said, well, that's all you are one-on-one. -on -one. But they were going to jump me, right? So my dad goes out, he said, I'll tell you what, 
you and you go on down the lane and fight. Do you know what I mean? Don't not all be together. Obviously, it didn't happen. He didn't want to. Didn't want to know. But when I went back to school, I just got called names. Just got isolated, and then I be I sort of become. It's, it's really weird, man. I just like the close. It was yeah, yeah. I just sort of isolated myself from from people, and it really affected me. And it's boxing was my escapism. It's like I was a completely different person. Like when I was outside of school, I don't know why I didn't change. School. I should have changed school, but maybe that's part of me being stubborn. And it probably did affect my schoolwork, although all I wanted to do was box. And my dream was just to become a world world champion. I wasn't, I was doing okay in school. I wouldn't say I was academic. I wasn't really that bothered with with school. Certain subjects I was okay with, but I just wasn't wasn't bothered. It's like, I remember speaking with a careers teacher and I remember her saying to me, I just remember she was over 50, so what are you going to do when you leave school? And I was like, I'm going to be a world champion. She just looked at me and laughed. I said, not seriously, Joe, like, um, Joseph, I think you call me. What are you gonna do? Leave school? I'm gonna be a world champion. But that's what I truly, truly believed in my mind because at the time I was winning two, three ABA titles. In school, I was getting taken the piss out of all the time, made it feel like shit coming home, not wanting to go to school. And it's weird to say that the safest place for me was the ring, and I loved it. And that was where I felt worthy. I felt some self worth and felt somebody was when I was boxing. Is that because people were taking away your confidence, taking away your self-belief, but yet you were feeling more at ease while you were actually fighting? Yeah, exactly. That's what I felt like, felt like somebody, you know? That's what I felt like home. A boxing ring is my home and they're going up there, beating people in the ring and, you know, learning and getting it all out, you know, because I was quite shy, very shy, you know, um, a very introvert. And boxing, I, I, I'd come out and I'd drop my hands, but outside I would be very quiet and within myself. And a lot of that is to do with, I think, from, from what happened in school. And you know what? I, I, it's best I won't change it because that strengthened me up as a kid. So when I was boxing, the likes of Lacey, boxing life, Hopkins were bullies. My head, me learning that as a kid, I think. And our strength. Yeah. Get me in the strength, and then uh, like fucking, I've been there before. Mm -hmm. Your last fight you lost was it when you were seventeen? Was it amateurs? Yeah, so the last fight I lost uh, was in the European Junior Championships in uh, Prague in uh, the old Czech Czechoslovakia, nineteen ninety July. I, bought, I won my first fight against Hungary in one second round, and it's the first year you ever had to wear head guards, right? And I, I, I never wore a head guard, even in pros. I never wore head guards. They'd have to wear a head guard, but I just hate head guards. And you put a big head guard on. I uh, box this Romanian guy and he had this style like with his, his and I've never seen this style before, right? So I won my first fight and went into that fight and he just kept flicking me, kept under my head guard. And I, anyway, I lost that fight and I still remember and like, I lost two fights that year. I lost in the Welsh seniors against a fight called Michael Smythe and Barry and on a split decision, lost that fight on points. And um, at that time, I had a trainer called Paul Williams who trained me he was the amateur boxing trainer, Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays. My dad would train me all the time, like I said. So what happened, I remember Paul Williams, he said, my dad was doing the music still in the band, and Milton Keynes coming back and forth. And I remember he was saying to me, I want you to turn pro. It's really hard. He was like a bit like a father figure, you know, because so, he was always trying to look after me in the gym and that. You know, obviously, when I say father figure, he was quite close to me, you know, boxing-wise. And... Um, he wanted me to sign a piece of paper to turn pro. I was a kid, I was 17. I was like, I don't want to like turn pro. And I had to tell him, it was hard. So, you know, I was really young, I was that poor. I never saw him again since. You know, he basically gave the keys to my, to my father and said to my dad, um, yeah, you all at the gym. So my dad said to me, Joe, do you want me to train you? And, um, as a main trainer, although he was my trainer anyway, right? As a main trainer, I thought, yeah, let's just do it. So think about it, like, we went on to win three consecutive ABA titles. It should, you know, the one thing that pissed me off was not going to the Olympics in 92. And to be honest, that's the only time I see my dad cry when it comes to boxing. He had to come home and tell me, even though I was a, the reigning ABA champion nationals, I weren't selected to the Olympics because they were, because I was from an unfashionable gym in Newbridge and all the people selected from Cardiff, they select the Cardiff boy to go to, to the qualifying tournament who lost to Robin Reed, and Robin Reed went on to the Olympics, they got a bronze medal. And I'm sat at home thinking, I should be at the Olympics, you know, um, in 92. 
but it wasn't to happen. Um, but anyway, won three consecutive ABAs. After the second, I was going to turn pro. I went well to weight like middleweight. And dad said, listen, nobody's won three ABAs at three different weights. Just, you need 20, 90, 20, just win another one. So I did. So I won another ABA. And then, uh, yeah, we basically had a conversation with Mickey Duff, a old promoter called Mickey Duff and Terry Lawless, right? That sounds like a corrupt name anyway. <laughs> yeah, so we drove up to Wardour Street. I still remember it. And I agreed, being a three times ABA champion, I didn't speak to any of the promoter. I didn't speak to Barry Yearn at the time or Frank Warren at the time. And it's because we were naive, you know, we just wanted to turn pro. So it might have taken an insight. It's like, you know, what was I fucking doing? Like, So basically, I, I walked out there with a £3,000 loan. I thought it was the sign-on fee. And I was on £300 a week. For, and I was on three hundred pound a week for twenty one fights. I oh. become British champion, young boxer of the year, and um, yeah. So I was on three hundred pound a week. Then, it, and then I didn't realize that three hundred pound a week was a loan. So I basically I, I had a baby. So my my, my ex wife got pregnant. Um, I, I was still renting a place, like semi detached. I literally had like two hundred pound in the bank. It was like twenty and oh, tw 19 KOs. British champion, had a fight on on ITV. I didn't even know the purse. And um, my dad knew, I said, dad, you know, and at the time I was frustrated because Frank Warren was taking over and I wasn't getting no air time. None of my fights were getting shown on TV. And my father, my dad went up to to London to speak to Frank Warren. And um, yeah, so basically, you know, he offered me decent money, good sign on fee. And um, because I, I got fucked over regarding never seeing contracts and that, it just, uh, I had to pay him the, the loan. <laughs> so you're paying to fight, basically? I had to pay a loan. The first thing I did was that £3,000. I bought, I bought a fucking, I bought a Ford Sierra. Oh, cars, I didn't, eh? I, I didn't have no insurance, no license. <laughs> <laughs> I was driving around for about like three years and suddenly I'd done a quick test and, and I, I passed my test, thank God. So first you, time. So they had signed, you had signed a deal for 21 fights. Your first 21 fights, you had 20 knockouts, British title, flying, starting to make a kind of name for yourself in the yeah, scene. Yeah, I was the young boxer of the year. And you were getting shafted. Yeah, like, I never saw a contract. I never saw a contract. Um, and, you know, it was just... How was did you even know you were still in a contract? Well, that's it. You know, that's how I got out of it because I, I remember Frank Warren and obviously, so you're in the contract and uh, obviously, you know, I, they were my managers and also my promoters. So it's a conflict of interest, you know what I mean? So obviously looking after themselves. So I was fighting, I was getting frustrated and I thought something's gotta happen. And as it happened, yeah, yeah, same with Frank Warren. Um, I had three fights and he promised a world title fight and it happened, you know, I had the three fights. I was on Sky Sports, which was great. I was where I wanted to be, I was getting paid decent money. And then, yeah, I was just, you know, it was, it was great. I had a fight with uh, Steve Collins. Uh, Steve Collins was the champion and um, he sort of, uh, he didn't fancy the fight, you know. I, I he said he was injured. There's a couple of reasons, but yeah, I understand why he didn't. You know, obviously he was he was in big fights with uh, Eubank and Ben, and obviously he's fighting this young kid that's not already got a massive name. Twenty knockouts in twenty one fights, is it worth the gamble? But then stepped uh, Chris Eubank, who, um, if anything, I was more wary of with the Eubank because he's one of them guys where when his back's against the wall, he's a dangerous, dangerous fucking animal. But you, you know. put him on his ass the first, what is it, 20 seconds, the first minute or something? Nah, nah, but that's the thing. It's probably the worst thing I did, right? Because <laughs> bear in mind, I knocked my first 20 fights before my hands started packing in because my hands got worse as my career mm. went on. I knocked 19, I think, of the first 20 fights. And um, I went eight rounds twice, five rounds once. Everybody else was knocked out the first two rounds. So he boxed in the guy, Eubank, who's been in wars, who's seasoned, man. He knows how to get in there. I always remember, like, the press conference, I was, I was cocky as fuck. So I remember, I think it was at the Grove, and I was like, fucking Chris Eubank. You know what I mean? I'm a fucking boy from on the train from the valleys. <laughs> I mean, in the funny, in the, I finally got the spotlight. And he, I see his Harley Davidson. I was like, fucking, I fucking... I love, I love watching Eubank, Ben, and Collins and all these. So I remember saying, I just remember looking across to him, and he's like, I said, I'm going to knock you out. <laughs> he just looked at me and went, I'm going to take you to one place that you've never been. I'm going to take you to the wow. And I'm looking, it was fucking wow, right? But trust me, in that fight, after three or four rounds, I was fucked. That's the only way to explain it. I was exhausted. Um, I think that um, I didn't know how to sort of pace myself. The excitement got to me. And 
dropping him with my first left hook, like you banks down. I'm like trying to finish a bit and every, throwing everything at him. Nothing more disheartening after about five, six rounds when you know you're only halfway through the fight. Inside, you know you're not going to knock him out. And you, and you see him walking around doing this, like walking around the ring and I'm like out of breath, I'm panting, but you know, it's just exhausted, absolutely exhausted. And he was true to his promise. You know, he did take me to the world. And it was by far the toughest fight I ever had as regards to exhaustion. I was fucking completely exhausted, man. Like I couldn't move for three days afterwards. Like lactic acid could not move. It was really, really tough. And like you said, I... Because he'd only lost two fights prior to that too, Steve Collins. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I know. But he was, I think, because Eubank used to fight. He had a good rest. And uh, fuck, he was, he was As tough. he is tough as people say that like, I've always rated him people love to hate him but people love to because he's that yeah. guy when you see him you do want to watch him because it's his character mm. it's his, his things that he does is what he says but what a fighter so when you put yeah. him on his ass and he told you look you're coming to the trenches with me like, and, was, yeah, and, and, that was and then but every time every interview I've watched with you Bank he's always spoke highly of you because people says you couldn't punch but he says you're fast and you're, you're and it's painful Steve yeah. Collins, every time I watched him, because I watched you all sitting around the table, he never ever seemed to give you credit. Why do you think that is? Do you think he was fearful Col of you? Um, Collins, I just think, well, I, I, to be honest, I, I honestly believe, like, I believe Collins would have been an easier fight than Eubank. Well, saying easier, because Eubank was fucking tough, man. Do you know what I mean? But I mean, I was preparing for you, I was preparing for Steve Collins, different style than Chris Eubank. Like Steve Fallon, Collins, Steve comes to you. I love counterpunching. It was lacy fights. I love people coming to me. I was preparing for Steve Collins. So when Eubank, when he sort of retired 10 days before the fight, Eubank was already boxing on the, on the card. He was already fit. But I was more worried about Eubank because, you know, you see what happened with himself and Michael Watson, he got injured. So you're a young kid and you see how dangerous he can be. You've seen him against Nigel Benn. He goes down, he gets back. And he's tough and he was hungry. He wanted, and I'm like... Okay, I was more nervous. I'll be honest with you, I was more a bit more nervous fighting Eubank than I was uh, fighting Steve Collins. And um, yeah, like I said, man, I, I remember I was supposed to come in the ring at 10, got pushed back to 11 o'clock. I didn't get in the ring till fucking 12 o'clock, right? So I got so excited in the change rooms. Me and dad done about fucking 15 rounds on the pads, right? So I, was, <laughs> I remember getting in the ring, I was all like, the, the music, uh, 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 was it Chef of the Ring? Oh man, I was just fucking, like I said, I was, I was just, after the first couple of rounds, I was tired. I was knackered, I was exhausted. Then, like I said, impatient myself, nervous energy and so on. And imagine everything you've ever trained for all your life on that one night from going, not just financially, but your dream as a 10 year old to become world champion against somebody that I've admired and watched as an amateur, watching them against Ben Watson, you bad, oh, one day I'd love to fight him and you're fighting, you're fighting him. Yeah. You know? Because when you won the British title, you didn't look as happy because I think you done an interview after and it says, well, it's nothing because I won the world title. Then when you eventually won the world title, what's that feeling like, Joe, for everything you've worked hard for? Everybody kind of underrated at that time. People just saying that you're doing shortcuts, this and that, but to then beat one of the best, one of the greatest. How was that feeling? Yeah, it was uh, it was awesome feeling, but like um, it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. Um, I wanted to be a unified world champion. And that's the thing, I always set myself goals. And my dad always said something to me that stuck in my head, always train like a challenger. And it's when you train like a champion, that's where you lose. Don't, you know what I mean? So always train like a challenger. Like So beating Eubank, I wanted to unify the title. And um, unfortunately, because of boxing as it is, business of boxing, when your stock has risen and you are a world champion, the other champions don't want don't want to fight, and unfortunately, I want to fight uh, Robin Reed when he was WBC champion. But when he just lost, then I fight him. So I had nothing again. He just lost a title, and then I fight him. The same with Richie Woodall, who's WBC champion. He just lost, so I fight him. Then there's Charles Brewer, there's the guy called Barry Mitchell. So all these guys have just lost titles, and then I fight him. So I beat six. I beat six basically world champions without their belt. So that was really frustrating and I was a bit disheartened about it because, you know, we tried to make the fights early with Roy Jones and uh, and um, uh, Bernard Hopkins way before it happened. And they just wasn't happening. And Sven Ocker was another one, a German fighter that he wouldn't fight. And I started, to, I started getting injured. Uh, I was injured a lot. 
um, fuck, some of my fights, to be honest, I, I found a struggle to get motivated for. You know, I remember boxing on the undercard of um, Mike Tyson and against uh, the fight called David Starry. I remember people booing. It's fucking disheartening, man. <laughs> it's like, for fuck. But it was just, it was just styles didn't mix and I was switching off in fights. It's like, you should never switch off. I remember sat in the corner and looking around. My dad, give me a fucking, what are you looking around for? And she's like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm struggling to get motivated. It's like I've reached that level and I want to fight the next level. I, mean, I was struggling a little bit for motivation. I was always 100% fit, but I mean up here, you know, I didn't fear an opponent. I know I could beat that guy. That's why I always fought the best. The best fighter I boxed is when you saw the best of me. The likes of Lacey, Kessler, then you see me fight my best. But other fighters, I'm supposed to be quite easy. I would like maybe switch off a bit. And that, although I'd always be fucking tremendously fit. Do you know what I mean? I mean, I was at a great engine because I trained hard, but up here, man, you need a little bit of a fear factor to think if I don't fight my best, you know, I could lose. Do you think that's where bullying at school kicks into play? I don't want to be bullied. So, because I know in the Lacey fight, is it Lacey? Yeah. You were scared. You were going to pull out two weeks before. I, f I think you got injured as well. Why was that? Was that the fear of everything? Do you think that stems from school days as well? Um, I, I'm not sure. With Lacey, I just fear of failure. And it's something I always had. I lost nine amateur fights in 120 fights. Um, last defeat was a 17. So all of a sudden, I got this fight. Jeff Lacey comes along, right? You know, he, he's he, by 90% of the press, he was going to beat me. You know, boxing news, like 90%. I was a bookies underdog any time ever. And yeah, I, you know, I wanted to fight, you know. Um, I think three weeks, two weeks before the fight, I got injured. I'll be honest, it wasn't a massive injury, but it was, it was an injury. It played in my mind. I went to Harley Street. I still remember going to Harley Street, having an injection in my hand. I come back. I was on the Great Western, the train, rat like coming back. I, I still remember it. I was, hey, Dad, what, 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 what? They said, they said, I got to pull out. Said, You're a fucking liar. What do you mean pull out? And I always remember him saying, Joe, if you pull out, they're going to call you a fucking chicken. What do you mean a chicken? So you already pulled out the fight. Well, you can't pull out. You're going to fight this fight. Anyway, cut off. And um, I remember coming to this gym in that ring. And um, I said, Dad, you know, he said, Joe, you're in fucking shape, amazing shape. And this is Dad who never boxed, right? And but he knew my style more than anybody. He said, fucking forget what people say about this guy. He said, listen, you know, shape your life. He said, you're going to beat this guy with one hand. I said, what do you want about? You can beat this guy with one hand. I said, Dad, fucking, fucking, I'm telling you now. He's like, just said exactly what was going to happen. After this fight, you're going to go to America. You're going to be a fucking superstar. You're going to be where you want after this fight. He said, forget these fucking so-called experts. Listen. And he said something so simple. He's like, listen, this guy moves four, five times with throws one punch. You throw five punches and move once. I move around and said, work it out. He said, from the first round to the 12th, no matter what, you're going to, you know, you're going to, you're going to fucking, you're going to, Annihilate him, annihilate him. He's, he's, this guy's gonna make it look great. And I'm thinking, obviously, I listened to my dad. I, I'm still injured, I didn't spar for two weeks. And he just said, you know, which is probably the thing that meant more to me, he just turned around and said, you know what, science, listen, I'm proud, I'm proud of you no matter what, but you have to fight this fight. When I lose, you have to fight this fight. And I was done as soon as he said that. But even though I couldn't punch for two weeks and beforehand I was thinking about pulling out, I was still doing my runs. I was still getting up at two in the morning, doing the five mile runs in the dark. So I was still in that, I don't know, you know, I'm thinking, am I going to fight this fight? Am I, you know, can I postpone it a few weeks? But realistically, it was never going to be postponed. And I'm walking, they say, when I look at fights, the Kessler, I mean, sorry, the, the, the Lacey fight, you know, just, just being the underdog, you know, being written off by your, your own press, even fucking, I remember my father had an argument with somebody in the bookies because somebody in the bookies come, come in and said, come have a bet on Jeff Lacey knockout <laughs> Zagas. My fucking local tell you, prick. <laughs> and then he kicked off. Uh -huh. Mate, that's what you fucking bet on him. So we died like a bet. And um, honestly, a lot of people thought I was going to lose that fight. But you know what? It's, uh, I remember like, it was something surreal in that fight. All the nerves I had, everything I had the day before the fight, we went up. And the day before the fight, it was snowing. I loved the snow. I remember getting up in the morning. And it's like, I had everything was calm. 
And even traveling on the train, all my nerves had gone. I was laughing, joking, we were playing cards. You know what I mean? Me, my uncle, my, my Sergio, my uncle, my trainer, obviously dad. We went, we went up and I was just like at the press conference, at the workout beforehand. I was just so relaxed and I just felt it was my time. I remember walking to the, um, walking from the hotel to the arena. I was a bit tired, right? I was a bit knackered. I was watching some film and I hate cold showers, man, right? Even though I jumped in the cold shower, jumped fucking back. I fucking hate cold water, right? So I walked, we walked to the MEN from uh, the hotel. But bang, as soon as the lights come on, I was like, shh. I was just fucking just zoned in. And just when I think about that fight, it's like, even when I got caught early on, I didn't feel nothing. It just, I think I could, I was on such a high that night. I feel like I could have done it for 15 rounds. You know, I threw over a thousand punches or whatever. And it just, that was probably the most tuned in I've ever been for a fight. It was just, just unbelievable. I was so proud, obviously, you know, my dad said, I told you, I fucking told you so. I told you what you're going to do. And what happened afterwards, you know, it went, my life, my career went to another level. Mm -hmm. Obviously America took notice, you know, HBO, Showtime, you know, the big names. And that's where at the age of 33, after boxed all them years, 33, 34, finally, I'm onto another stage where I, you can showcase your talent. Yeah. With the Lacey fight, how, why do you think that he, you were so fearful of him though? Because what was he, 20 and all? They were saying that he was the potentially the next Mike Tyson at the super middleweight division. Yeah, I wasn't fearful of him. I was never be feared of any guy. I he was, was solid though. No, he, yeah, but, yeah, but I wasn't fearing him. But like, it's just, I, the only thing, what drove me more than anything was the fear of failure, of losing, of failure. I still remember that first fight I ever lost as a 10 year old. I remember the last fight I ever lost. 17. When I was 17. I remember the Welsh Championship. I'm, I'm, I remember I've only really lost like nine, 10 fights. 120. I tell you about my losses, but I can't tell you about most of my wins. It's our fear of, it's our fear of failure. And it's because I trained all this time to get to this unification fight. So from being world champion in 1997, nine years of champion until I get a unification fight, then you're injured. Do you know what I mean? I'm injured. And um, I couldn't spar. So then you start having self-doubt in myself, like I could postpone it, you know what I mean? Maybe a few weeks because obviously my hand, like I had to have an injection. So I, I, I basically had injections, painkiller injections in my hand for, for, for years before fights. Why did your hands end up so bad, Joe? Um, punching people in the head. Just <laughs> pretty simple. Just fucking fucking it up. But, but hands were these. Yeah, I, I had hand trouble. You through so many punches, though. No, because no, but what happened? I adapted my style because when I was younger, I used to be a big, big puncher. Right? I remember box sparring with uh, Nicky Piper. He's I love Nicky. Right? So Nicky come to the boxing gym in my old gym. I was only eighteen. ABA champion. He just boxed Nigel Ben. Right, he just boxed Nigel Ben, and I remember him coming. He was going to box for a European professional title, so I walked to the gym with my bag, got into my old gym, and Nicky was there, like, and fucking, he looked looking sharp, man. The other, I think, had a Mercedes, a lovely car outside. Fucking, to me, he was like big name. Like, he just boxed, give Nigel Ben a really good fight. You know what I mean? And he's boxed for European title. And Charlie Pierce, the trainer, said, "Oh, can Joe do like six rounds? Said, Joe, don't do six rounds." Like, yeah, yeah, you know. The gym was full of kids in there. Yo, like, the Gavin was young, and the boys in the in the gym. And um, I remember uh, sparring and he was like, boom, boom, fucking, I might use a word in the bed, okay, back in. I remember slipping over and hitting him with a left and dropping him first round. So I go, Nicky Pipe, we'll just box for a world title, give Nigel Ben to fight. So that was really good for me, right? And he wobbled and he dropped. And I fucking, I thought, brilliant, you know what I mean? I was only like 18, 19, I just, and he was a lot bigger than me as well. He got back up, he'd done three rounds of his training, went like, that's enough. And he said to Nick, he said, I don't, you know, and tell Joe not to see it. I wasn't, I wasn't saying nothing. I fucking told everybody, man. <laughs> I was fucking over the moon. And I was uh -huh. thinking, so in my mind, I was thinking, I just fucking just outbox and drop Nicky Piper, just beat, you know, just box Nigel Ben and went like 10, 11 rounds, tough fight with him. Good fighter, bigger than me. Just all them things. So I was a big puncher. And I started my first six, seven, eight, ten 10 fights as a pro, knocking everybody out first round. So when the hand started to go, the injections, the quarter zones, I mean, every fight I had to have a painkiller before I got in the ring, basically, because I couldn't punch. So then I adapted my style. I think, well, I can't be loading up with my left hand anymore. So me and dad used to work on speed, even sparring. When I sparred, I did spar, but I spar with small guys. So I just move around, let them, you know, for my reflexes. 
I spar with the boys in the gym, um, like Nathan Cleverly, Bradley Price. It's small, but I wouldn't load up on them because I couldn't. It's not probably sparring with big guys. Again, so Matt, we'd, we'd tap about. So that was my sparring, was really moving, tapping around. Never had wars in the gym, you know? And, and to be honest, I think having wars in the gym isn't a good thing because you don't get paid to get beat up in sparring. You know, you get hit in the head enough. So, you know, for me, it was, it was just doing my footwork, using my speed reflexes, feints. And if you look at it, that probably added to my longevity in boxing because I boxed to be at the peak at 36, 37 is very rare. You know, the Lacey fight came at 33. A fight that uh, Mikko Kessler, who's an absolute at, at this peak, animal 39 and 0, all the barrels, Cardiff in my national stadium. You know what I mean? And then to go to America at 36, 37, you know what I mean? It's like... It's unbelievable. You know, it's, it's mad. So after the Lacey fight, then you got Kessler. He was 39 and 0. That was your biggest test for all the belts in the line fighting at Millennium Stadium. What's going through your mind before that fight? Was that because you were still people were always still you were still underrated all all the time. People were always doubting you. Why do you, why do you think there was so much doubt around you, even though the, the career that you had that you were hitting 42 and 0, 43 and 0? Why was there still doubt over your head? I, I don't know. I think it was hard from the start because I was from uh, South Wales Valleys. Do you think if you're an English, an English boxer, you'd have been fucking would, everywhere? Oh, yeah. I think it was from a different country, different places. And I got a Sardinian father, Italian name. And from the valleys, you know, near the valleys. I mean, not, not in Cardiff. So me being from my little club stopped me going to the Olympics. And I think a lot of it was to get, it took a long time to get that sort of, um, just the way it is. Just the way it is, I think. But you know what? You know, um <sighs> Like the Kessler fight, man, that, like I said, to that was so much pressure on that fight because I, I remember watching Kessler in Copenhagen when I boxed and the Tyson undercard, be a, fight, a fighter called Will McIntyre in five rounds. And I looked at, I watched the undercard, I thought, this fucking kid, he's, he's going to be good, this boy. I just noticed straight away, Kessler, Mikkel, I think he's going to be a good fighter. I kept my eye on him, seeing him come through the ranks. And when we made that fight, it's a fight I wanted, you know, it's, um, I wanted to be at that age of 34, 35. I just wanted to have all the belts. I was IB, I was IBF champion, ring magazine champion, WBO champion, the two belts missing. And that was the WBA, WBC, which Mikhail Kessler had. And yeah, I knew it was gonna be a tough fight. I, I'd have to be at my best. And um, it was a lot of pressure, but I, I just so many, I just don't think about the crowd, man. You know, you can't think it's, it's hard enough to just think about the guy you gotta fight. And like what I say, you know, um, first four rounds was tough. He hurt me in the third round, buzzed me up a couple of, I think it was the third or the fourth. Buzzed me a little bit, but I got a great chin. I believe it, fuck. Went back and I, one good thing, I, I just had to adapt. And that's one thing with my style is it's quite unique. You know, I can change my style and just not really think about it. So I decided to box. <laughs> so I started moving using my, Started frustrating him, caught him with a good body shot, him with a body shot in the eighth round and just outboxed him. Um, but, you know, using the fight from the first round to the 12th, he's probably the best fight I boxed. Um, he, he was, he was like I said, 39 and 0. My side was 42 and 0. All the belts, he was younger, you know, he was hungry. Um, he was tough, you know, and I was just so happy to win that fight. But I knew that was going to be my last fight at super middleweight because the struggle to make the weight was, was fucking, it was awful, man. I mean, like I lost 36 pounds in 15 weeks for that fight. And the pain of oh, not being able to eat, drink, the dehydration. And the 24, 36 hours before the fight wasn't enough to get my strength back. I was still weak, but I was obviously my engine, my fitness was, was there, but I, I was lacking my punching power, not just because of my hands, because draining my weight so much. And then, that was it. And I said to dad, like, if I could done it, like 10 years, beat Michael Kessler, basically got every belt there. It's only one thing to do. And that was to, to go to America and uh, there's a big mouth out there called Bernal Hopkins. And I thought it'd be great to move up, be a two-way world champion. And I always wanted to fight in the States. I was fighting, wanted to fight in America. So that was the next step for me. That's the journey, was there no, anything coming into your mind to retire after you'd won all the belts you'd achieved it all or completion your main objective was to go to America and make a mark there because the Americans didn't rate you did they because they think British he's not fought anyone 
Yeah, did, yeah. Did you did you have to pay for your own flight to go to yeah. America to wind Hopkins up to build yeah, up for the fight? Yeah, so that's what I'm there. Said, yeah, so I, I suppose I more respect after the Lacey fight, you know. But uh, I remember speaking with um, all my old promoter, Time War, Frank Warren, and uh, <clears throat> basically I think what, what was happening at the time is all about fighting the O2. But I knew it was coming to the end of my career, fighting the O2, and I was like, I want to fight Hopkins. Other fights are not going to happen, this and that. And I'm thinking, fucking, I want to fight Hopkins. You know what I mean? He's the one talking. I thought, let's, let's just cut out the promoters and, and the, that side of it. I just uh, beat Kessler two weeks before. And Ricky Hatton was boxing Mayweather. I could do with a fucking weekend away anyway. So it was me, <laughs> Enzo, Mike. We went out there on the piss celebrating. And um, yeah, so I remember going out there. I spoke to HBO and this is like at the, at the, the press room. And Hopkins was at the press room. And um, yeah, I, I just, I still visualize that. I remember going in there. I could see him coming there. I fucking see him making his way with his little entourage there. And that's when he says in beautiful words, I've never let a white boy beat me. I've never let a white boy And I go, if you fight me, you will lose. I didn't know what to say. If you fight me, you lose. And we just said back and forth. And then bear in mind, there's no like social media really there. That was like on YouTube, but there was no like social media like you got now. But instantly, them words. And people say, oh, that means you offended. No, I was thinking, fucking brilliant. This fight's going to get made. It's going to be a big fight now because he said that. So that was it. I got on the phone to Frank. I said, you know, check out YouTube. I think... Uh, me coming to to Las Vegas and paying for my flights in my own room and this and that, and um, yeah, it was a good was a good uh, good thing to do because I'd, whether the fight would, would be made, I'm not sure. But if you think about it, you know, it's just an amazing experience. Come to Vegas from where I come from, the little holes I boxed to be in like in in, in Vegas and seeing the likes of you know Smith Sloan, Alan Schwarzenegger, you name them. The, um, is it, Whitney Houston was like sat right behind my boy. And I remember what my boy told me afterwards when I got dropped first round, there's a woman put her hand, my boy, Connor, he was there early, he's like, oh, your dad's gonna be okay. Afterwards, like fucking Whitney Houston, that was like, do you know what I mean? This is mad, you know? Michael J. Fox is a big fan of you. He was yeah. doing interviews and promoting you and he, talking highly of you. Was Al Pacino not there as well? Al Pacino wasn't actually at the fight, but I had a, I was with him two days before because he had a, he was, he was at the, he was a foot, a, 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 premiere of one of his films 88 minutes what's he like oh he's fucking that's one of the only times i've ever been starstruck i was like <laughs> oh but you know it's like scarface looks quite small in real life do you know what i mean <laughs> but uh honestly uh, he's one of my fucking favorite i love but you know he's a lovely guy do you know what i mean he's he was a lovely guy and um it was nice to chat with him and for a little bit and uh, like i said it was uh it's unbelievable i stayed outside of the um of the strip and the strippers, I stayed outside. <laughs> Not good <laughs> people boxing, but I basically stayed. We we hired the villa um, to stay away from it. Only really come into it, um, come into the strip to do the press conferences and so on. But yeah, like I said, man, it was just, uh, it was a great night, great occasion, and um, yeah, you know, to, to win that fight was was brilliant. But then I knew that that was it for me. Tired. But you get put in your ass the first the first round by Hopkins. I did. Were you thinking, going up away, that I'm going to get beat? Or was there any time that you doubted yourself that I've maybe I stepped too much, step up too much? No, not at all. I, well, listen, I got dropped four times in my entire life. And never as an amateur, and never as a, you know, never in the gym even, right? So there was a flash knockdown. I rushed him, I got caught. And out of the four times I went down, I was, wasn't hurt. But with Hopkins, he was very, very frustrating. His style was horrible, you know, was, styles blend and his, we just didn't blend. He fought the perfect fight to beat me, which was just go defensive, grab on the inside, stop me from working. But, you know, after four or five rounds, I, you know, my, my, my stamina, my engine, my, my punch work rate, I took over the second half of the fight. Of course, you're fighting in America. So, you know, I was nervous, obviously, afterwards. But I remember thinking when they say split decision, you like, and then I was just, you know, so happy you know, to win that. And um, yeah, I, to be, that is the fight. I thought I've done it. I want to finish, you know, I'm, I'm finish at the top. There's a fine line between going on too far in boxing, you know, and 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 so on. And it wasn't about money, but legacy. It was about legacy for me. It was to have that perfect zero and be very rare meant more than keep fighting and losing, keep fighting and making a lot more money. It wasn't for me. And that's what, not what drove me. Obviously we all would be comfortable, but, I just felt I was cutting corners in the gym. I was, you know, 
it's just, I just, injuries and so on. My kids were getting older. They were getting upset. I said, Dad, when are you going to retire? When are you going to retire? You know, and yeah, it was, um, decision I made was, you know, to, to have one last fight. Because your kids were upset that you get put down. Was that the first fight they'd ever really been at? When they watched you because they, they were upset at the end of that fight, I believe they wanted you to retire and they were still young at the time. Yeah, they were still young. Yeah, Connor and Joe, they were about 10 at the time and it caused maybe eight. And um, yeah, I remember. Yeah, so my last fight. So that's the first time they saw me drop. So after Lacey fight, I allowed them to come to watch me fight. So they come to Kessler. And I swear, I can't remember who boxed after it was Kessler. <laughs> was it? Uh, a couple more fights. and all, Not Kessler. And obviously uh, they come to America. But Connor was the youngest. He basically, I remember when I fought against Roy Jones Jr. at the Madison Square Garden, I'm warming up ready to get in the ring. And when the security brings my boy, he's always crying his eyes out because he remembers me getting dropped. And I'm thinking, oh, okay, so give him a hug before I get in the ring. But it's probably a good thing that the, uh, when they changed me, I got fucking dropped again for a strong night. It's not making that in a bit. <laughs> See, when you beat Hopkins, that was Freddie Roach Hopkins trainer. Yeah, Freddie Roach. So how does Enzo, your father, a musician, but then <clears throat> being able to compete with one of the greatest trainers of all time to then, because did he not use music notes as like for techniques for yourself? No, like like, six and seven I don't know where they get that from. We just, we, just, we just had their own style from young. It's hard to explain. We just evolved our style. You know, my dad, you know, we love Marvin Hagler, Sugar Ray Leonard. So he tried to blend them like both together. So like my dad is like, it wasn't just me, you know, he was obviously trained Gavin Reese from his gym to be world champion. Oh, Enzo Mack come to this gym, become world champion. Nathan Cleverly, to be honest, you know, he, he was from this gym. He's trained this as a kid. So he, he was, he was a world champion. So it's no coincidence. He had such a tremendous energy, my dad. He's so, had so much, so, so such an energy, but not just that, he just knew me. He was the best trainer world for me. He knew every style would be awkward. He knew Hopkins would be awkward for me. He knew he would be awkward. He, he knew me inside out. He's watched me thousands around sparring. He, I used to spar with my dad growing up. He, he could box a bit. You know, we used to spar together. And um, he knew it would, would be tough, that fight. But uh, he was 100% confident, you know, that, that would win. But he knew I'd have to work. He knew that Hopkins would s spoil spoil go backwards which i hate i like people coming to me i love to counter punch to chase a fight so after you know you go back to your corner after the first round you're in las vegas you fucking just got dropped you're thinking shit i'm two rounds down already <laughs> fucking, oh and it's frustrating i kept for, trying to throw punches he kept holding on it's just frustrating like i was i had so much more energy it wasn't a hard fight it was, it was a frustrating fight it wasn't hard it's like i was fresh after 12 rounds i didn't feel really tired you know but Hopkins, like, he's just an expert, you know, he just, you know, he's an all-time great, isn't he? You know, to be an all-time great. And I think considering he was an old man when I boxed him, I think six years afterwards, he won the world title at 50. So I think that win is, is shows one of my, you know, one of my best wins, if not the best wins, because, yeah. you know, he's, a, he's an all-time great, you know? To get an American and beat an American in their own backyard, especially split decision. As yeah. soon as it says split decision, you must be thinking, fuck. I'm out. I've lost. I've yeah. got that. I've got that loss to my name. But to win that is unbelievable again. So when you were getting through that, were you fighting that 12th round thinking, this is my last round? I just, I, all I was thinking was to just work, work, work. I think after six rounds, I felt I was on top. Because um, although, although it was a messy fight, I felt I was doing, outworking him. You know, um, he was just trying to buy time. He was fighting low blows and pretending he got it in the fucking balls. And I was like, come on, get him. Yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, so it just nerve wracking. You know what I mean? It's nerve wracking that. Um, so when they say I had a new, and it was like, yeah. So uh, that was it really. And um, I'll be honest, my last fight, it's, uh, I knew it was going to be my last fight. I, I spoke to dad. We didn't say it to the press, but this is it now for me. I just felt this was it. You know, I was cutting corners, going into my last fight uh, against Roy Jones Jr. Um, and my dad sensed it, you know. I remember one day, I think I uh, skipped training about four weeks. I was still in great shape, but I skipped about two days. And he said, hey, he said, you know what? You're going to get your fucking ass kicked. What are you all about? He said, I know. What do you mean, know what? 
be like piss like fucking day before. <laughs> it's only one day in like, you know, in about 10 weeks I've ever done that. And I um, had a few drinks. Why do you think you've done that? Um, why did I do that? It's just, I don't know. I just, well, that's what I'm saying. I knew it was time to quit because, you know, going back to the world, you know, and legacy, well, I, feel, I felt I'd done everything. I, financially, I felt I was secure. I beat the Hopkins, I, you know, and then, but then you, you go up there, maybe it's your ego as well, you know, it's just like, you know, you got the trappings, you got the money now, you know, sports personality of the year award, this, you know, and you're thinking, yeah, I don't know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's God test us all, isn't it? So um, <laughs> it was, um, I come back and dad said, you're gonna, all you work for, you're gonna fucking get beat. I mean, what are you talking about? He just had a knack of knowing what to say and when to say it. Because we were so close. He's like my best friend. Brother. Not just my trainer, best friend, like since little, since I was a kid, he just knew me so much. I knew how to make me tick. And trust me, we went, we went, went and trained on the pads and I smashed the pads because of what he said. And um, yeah, it was, uh, yeah, bless him, man. Bless him. How was that? Madison Square Garden, your last fight, Roy Jones. What's going through your mind? Did you feel mentally sharp going into that fight? Yeah, I felt I felt confident. I felt sharp. Um, if you watch the fight, I'm dropping my hands. I still, even today, I don't know. It wasn't the plan. It just something that happened. And I think you can see in that fight, I knew it was my last fight. I was just enjoying myself. Fuck, the, except for the first round, I went off. I fucking went on the floor and <laughs> game. Like, Whoa, I got up like... <laughs> Shit, it was like a forearm. We look back, I went down on the street, got caught with a forearm. Um, I got up, but I, um, I remember going there into the Madison Square Garden in the afternoon when they just put the ring together. And I was just looking around thinking, fucking, this is it, man. This is my last fight. I, but since I was a kid, like I'm, I'm in Madison, micro box, I'm in Madison Square Garden. And then it's like tingly, you know what I mean? It was like the atmosphere and just really soaking in the energy. And and during the fight, you know, I was uh, well. I could have stopped Roy Jones or not. I, you know, I, I was happy. I was I was enjoying doing the twelve rounds, and um, I always remember like the last few rounds. I still remember thinking, Joe, just look around. Last three rounds, you like last two rounds, and the last round, I was like, this is the last round of your life, man. Just enjoy it. I, that's what was that was what was in my head, and that was it. And um, after that fight, I knew that would be it. That would make a comeback. I wouldn't come back. People were saying, well, why didn't you just get the 50 and 0? You'd like three off, making history. But it just, that was my number, number 46. I was just, you know, I was like I said, I would just felt like it was time to think about my children, you know. Hmm. Maybe, maybe think about myself, you know what I mean? Because like I said, I was getting injured all the time. You're, you're getting punched, you're getting hit. You know, it's a long time to get hit and you got the rest of your life to live. And boxing is not everything, you know? So when I look back, part of me does think maybe I should have continued and it really affected my father and my dad not boxing again. I never really thought about how my dad would be affected because I, I like after boxing, you know, you are lost. I did feel pretty lost, man, because, you know, you after the euphoria and the fucking... You're under fear, man. You're top of the world. You know what I mean? You, you're, you're Superman. You think you are. But, you know, there's other things except for boxing. And that's hard maybe to adapt and take in after a while, you know? Do you think that's why a lot of boxers come back? Because there's a void missing? Yeah, I think so. I think that is uh, part of why they come back. Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, I missed, the, obviously, the, the, the um, get, up, get up in the morning. Obviously, the euphoria win, there's nothing like it, you know, that regimental aspect of it where you got 12 weeks for the fight. So in between fights, I, you know, I, I go on holidays, you know, get fat, eat loads of nice food you can afford it now, you know, have a good drink, then you're training again. So when that's gone, you know, you, you don't realize that what you're going to do, you know, you have to complete change of mindset because you haven't got that goal to fight again. So it's easy when people say, okay, uh, well, do something else. Come on, you do anything you want to do, Joe. 
okay. So I, I decided I went to London. I bought a nice place in London. It's sort of um, probably the worst thing I did. I was trying to be fucking an actor. <laughs> no good. I done two two little parts, but um, yeah, I was doing all these other things, and um, yeah, it was uh, it was quite tough, you know. Um, done a few TV bits, TV things, and I fucking nothing really made me happy. You just accepting that you did do what you achieved, man. With your dad, like you, you fucking done it, man. Do you know what I mean? So it, it took a while, you know, to be honest with you, it took a while to sort of um, come to terms with, you know, end the boxing. Normality. But what a career, Joe, like to have 46, you know, and it's easy for me to say looking from the outside, but to have 46, you know, the world at your feet, known as one of the greatest of all times, going through that journey with your dad. We'll touch on your dad in a little bit, but we had a, a speak, we were speaking earlier that like your dad was there when you were at your best. Your dad lived your journey with you. Like my dad always seen me as a fuck up. He passed away when I was yeah, going through my life of drugs and crime and all the bullshit. Yeah. Now I'm starting to spread my wings and part of me, like, my dad would have loved to have been here today. He yeah. was a massive fan of you. Like, yeah. He would have loved to have been at the interviews That's and meeting people. Like, he never seen me at my greatest your dad yeah. was there every minute living your dream with you like that's a that's a beautiful thing that will live for you until you take your last breath like your legacy lives on, on forever every young boxer every boxer that now looks up to Joe Kozaghi as an inspiration like 46 you know will, will another British boxer ever do that like you, you don't know with, with boxers just now like people it's, it's mad like some boxers don't even get past 30 fights now there's like yeah there's thanks man. Always, no, like, what you've done and what you've accomplished is fucking second to none and and that's Thank a hard part like any boxer would take for even half your fucking career but for three forty six, you know king of the world and then you're still finishing boxing and feeling as if there's something missing loneliness kicks in it's it's scary like how life can make the twists and turns like that what do you think that is then like for you, I think that's gratitude, appreciation for what you've achieved, or the lack of things for boxers because you're used. You're a, you're a circus act as well for people like yeah. the promoters, managers do this, and then when you stop, there's fuck all else for you. It's like people get into the army, they come out and yeah, they've yeah. not got anything. The majority of people yeah. homeless are from um, ex army, and it's mad. But do you think there should be more places putting things to help boxers for after their careers? I think so. I think, you know, um, definitely it's a lot of depression that goes on. A lot of people lose their way. You know, it's sad, really, the, the toughest of sports. You know, I don't think it's enough protection for, for boxers or, or to go forward as regards to educating fighters, you know, um, giving them another, because 99% well, of boxers realistically don't make enough money to continue with their life and be comfortable. They have to get a job. And if they lost, what, what do they do? You know? So yeah, you know, it's, it's it's tough, you know. It's, it's a lot of sports is like that way. I mean, I, I sort of, uh, you know, finished as the best you could finish undefeated, but still, I was lost. You know what I mean? I was <laughs> lost. I was fucking lost, man, for a while, and you know, I, I didn't, I didn't realize it for a long time. You know, it took a long time, and you know, it's, everybody wants to invite you a party, there's always something going on, there's holidays, this, you fucking indulge in, 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 in lots of stuff. And, you know, um, yeah. And uh, before you realize it, it got like fucking 10 years ago and passed. Wow, man, time goes quick. I, yeah. I think I should have stayed in the ring as I say. <laughs> yeah, it was the best place to be, uh -huh. man. But um, yeah, like you said, you know, to finish four undefeated is, is a blessing, but you know, I. I uh, still miss miss it. I, I kept away from boxing. Do you know what I mean? I, I consciously left boxing because of just politics. Just I, I done all my life. But I think maybe I stayed away from it too long. You know, it's uh, my boys. Obviously, they they got this gym back up and running. It was not useful for you many years, and it's great that they uh, they love boxing and obviously they're good boxing trainers because they watch me and they, I've taught them for years. Mm. You know. And it's a continued legacy, my dad, you know, I he'd love it. You know, I still feel his energy in his place, you know, he's uh he's missed every day, you know. How was that for you, Joe, like the loss of your father? I know he's one of the blood, brothers, best friends, like to live the career that you've done and him being by your side to then passing away, did that really affect you mentally, Joe? Oh, it's yeah, it's fucking what I say, it's uh 
so it's a lot of, a lot of shock you know my dad was uh, unbelievably fit um he had a few illnesses and it, yeah it was, uh, it was a shock man it's uh it's one of the things it's, it's still hard to believe you know i lost my dad in september 2018 and just you know just i could miss every day you know just uh it's hard and i lost my mum like 16 months later you know it's you know you think boxing's tough but fucking real life is really tough you know god tests us all as my dad used to say and here is a test my friend you know it's uh it's tough but um you know i'm a faith you know i still feel his energy i know he's still with me you know and um and like you said he's you know never forgotten the legacy he's done what we've achieved in boxing means more for the fact he always be remembered you know yeah he's a memories of live on and i'm sorry to hear for your for your losses but your joke will zag you that you'll bounce back from it you'll use it as strength and fire for no water what you want to do for the next chapter of your life it's easier says than done loss but we don't know how to handle loss or grief because we're all soft joe we've been speaking like we're all sensitive beings we're all yeah. se searching for something to try and fulfill the pain and stop like the fucking meth the madness that's up here it's like the frog big box of frogs just everything yeah. jumping about not knowing where to go but like I says earlier, like what you've achieved, what you've accomplished, your mum and dad lived that life with you. Getting to travel the world, seeing their yeah. son being one of the greatest, like, that's a feeling that you can never buy. That like, People die without ever succeeding in anything in life. People lose parents and there's no connection yeah. with people's parents don't see their kids, those kids don't even see their parents. Like, you've got a bond there that people would be proud of. There's probably people made amends with their fathers because they've probably seen the way you acted on screen nah, thanks, love man. attention the, like, no doubt there'll be fucking wars when the cameras are off but <laughs> yeah he's whatever mix you's had to create what you created it worked perfectly and i don't think that can be rectified i don't think people can copy that i think fathers and sons have tried with the boxing world but never got as far as you two done that's the the, the most successful father and son boxing career I, I know anyway Floyd way well on his father but I'm sure they fell out a few times but your yeah. dad was there through thick and thin and that's a beautiful thing like I say they'll be proud and I believe in energies and frequencies I believe yeah. they'll still be here and yeah. that's all you can do Me so too. when you after the career do you regret not going to America quicker Joe? Um, do I regret everything's meant to be man I think mm. it's all destiny you know I think it was just meant to be it was meant to be a struggle if it wasn't a struggle, I wouldn't be a world champion. If I went to the Olympics and won a medal, I wouldn't be a world champ 10 years. Probably have had the money when I was a kid and just fucking golf flash and just, Spunk it happens. Up. It happens, you know, I had to struggle to be where I was. Even though I beat Chris Eubank for the title, I still couldn't afford my mortgage. Well, just about paid off my house at the time. So I wasn't getting big paydays till the end. So if, if I got big paydays, then that's where I look at it. Do you know what I mean? So, no, it was just perfect timing. I remember a story. I remember speaking to Emmanuel Stewart, the great Manny Stewart. He's working for HBO, and I remember speaking to him um, before the Roy Jones fight. So we just after the weigh in, we talked. Hey, so Joe, what are you going to do after this fight? I said, and he's the only person I spoke to really, uh, except for my family and my dad. That was going to be my last fight. So you're going to fight next? I said, Manny, I think this is going to be my last fight. And he was like really i went yeah yeah i just think it's my last fight he said but i'm thinking about getting the 49 i know and i always remember what he said he said he said joe if you retire he said he said we have rocky marcella 49 fights but yeah they i think about eight world title fights how many world title fights you have they said 21 world title fights so he'd be world champion a white european fighter be a world champion for for 10 years and, he, and this is his words you come to america and not beat one black legend but the second black legend in in, in roy jones jr he said, if you retire, he said, people won't appreciate what you've done now. But he said, in the years to come, people will really appreciate because they want to happen again. And that was Manny Stewart saying that. Whether it happens again, maybe it will, maybe it won't. But the fact that he spoke to me just affirmed that it is the right thing to quit, you know, to retire because, you know, he was fucking, it was like 37, like 36, 37. And yeah. You gotta be realistic that you know nobody's like a superman everybody is beatable on a given night i've been beatable on a given night just when i fought 
not my best fights. I was still betting my opponents. <laughs> if, I, if I had fought not 100% against Kessler, against Lysa Hopkins, then could have lost. This way it is. Yeah, Decision-wise, whatever, you know? So you just, you know, to me, that was just like, legacy meant more. Although sometimes I do think that, but I think, fuck, I should have kept going. <laughs> <laughs> See the money all these fighters are making. I thought, wish, uh -huh. I wish my career uh -huh. was now with the, with the yeah. social media shit uh -huh. that happens. You see all these fucking, like these so-called YouTubers. <laughs> I think, I mean, maybe I should still yeah, make a fight yeah, back. Yeah. Yeah, maybe maybe you should call one yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe I should. But uh -huh. I think we see uh, Roy, Jones, uh, Roy Jones fought with Tyson at exhibition. I think mm -hmm. he made more money there. Um, Roy Jones, he did against me, and I was just eight two minute rounds. So, I'll fight you, Mike. Just give me six months training. <laughs> Would you have a, with the mindset you've got now? You seem to be getting your spark back, and do you know what? Planning for the future, and, and big things are going to happen again. But do you ever feel as if, okay, do you know what? I fancy a little exhibition. Yeah, I think so. I yes, think, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know? Do you know what? Why not? And you see all these fighters making money. I'm thinking, you know, I'm listen. I, I ain't got the engine for 12 rounds anymore. Um, yes, I am a bit overweight. <laughs> Never going to make zoom in. I'll try to get a cruiser weight, but I still got hand speed, man. It's still quick. It's still sharp. It's still reflexes. I've done a, I've done a couple of rounds on the, on the pads. Where, Boy, your daddy hands are so quick. I went, yeah, it's still quick. But do you know what? Eight twos. Can't tell. Why not? Who would you call out? Oh, it's going to make me the most money. <laughs> what, about, what about Steve Collins? No, Steve. Oh, I'd fight. I don't know. I'd fight anybody. It'd be a bit of fun. I don't know. I was thinking. I was thinking about doing it for my fiftieth next year. Go for so that. So maybe I'm doing it for my fiftieth. We'll see. I'll, I'll get back in a bit of training and see how the old bones carry on. But you know why? It's just. Uh, yeah, it was a great sport, man. Love the sport. It's, it's great to see fighters come back and have a bit of fun in the ring. Tyson and Jones fight was good. It was fucking actually okay, man. Tyson was Tyson was decent. I thought I thought he was like, man, but he's in his fifties. I know. He's, he's fucking play. Do you know what I mean? Like, do you think that that's what you need? A bit of structure. How would you feel though with your old boy not being there? Yeah, that's the one thing, you know. I have thought about that because when I lost my dad, I thought I could never box again anyway, you know, because dad was obviously we were just in he was always in the corner. But if I was doing an exhibition, I'm sure it would be my, my son's in the corner. Mm -hmm. So it would still be, you know, you know his, his blood still runs through our veins. So it would be like, he would be there anyway, you know? Yeah, it's, it's, like you're, you're, you asked for boxing. Like you are, a, like, do you think you came away from it though? For the, the 10 years or whatever, the, how many years were away? Because you could have got sucked back into it and you could have pro possibly took another fight on. <clears throat> yeah, pos yeah, possibly. Yeah, that's, that's maybe what it was. Yeah, that's maybe what it was. I, I, I still think back to why did I just leave Wales and go to London and probably at the time, in hindsight, I'll think back because my dad's not here. Maybe I lost a lot of time. Dad wanted to, to continue boxing, managing and training and me not being in the gym probably affected dad because I didn't really think at the time that, you know, he'd miss box as much as he did. And I was just getting on with my life, you know. I was just trying to do other things, TV, do all, this, all that bullshit. You know, you think it's the right thing to do at the time. But... I think it was to escape, you know, being, doing one thing all your life, you know, I think we're just escaping, trying to do other stuff and trying to get out of my system, but it doesn't just go out your system. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's who I am. And obviously I am Joe, you know, the, the, the person, you know what I mean? But boxing is, you know, the sport of boxing gave me the life I have, you know, and made a legacy for myself and my father, you know, for my kids, for the gym. And obviously you're very proud of that. And, um, yeah, you know, maybe it's time now, you know, now I'm feeling pretty good, you know, coming to 50 is a big milestone. It's time to reflect and look at life and what you've done, what you've achieved, things you've done wrong. And like I said, my sons, they love boxing and maybe it's time to give them a, a helping hand and hopefully, who knows, maybe make a world champion from you one day, you know? That's in your blood. I think that's where you'll thrive. I think that's when you're feeling most alive and you feel as if important that no matter what car we drive or how much money we're making, there's something missing if we're not trying to achieve an end product, an end goal to working towards something. Like no matter what you put your mind to, you want to become the best. Yeah. And that's where you think, fuck it. But now you're getting that spark back. You're, you're hitting to that 15. You're thinking there's people's training. What age is Freddie Roach? What, they're, they're in their 60s and they're mm, still training. Yeah. World fighters, like world class fighters. Like, you've got the ability. So that's you 
you can't just, I'm not saying quit, but give up. Like we all have our wobbles, but you've got the potential to be teaching someone who just stays around the corner to be one of the greatest as well. You've got the ability, you've got the backup to do it. You've got the knowledge yeah. to help train somebody to leave yeah. and change their family's life the way that your dad mm. helped you do yeah. with your career. Do you know what I mean? I think that's where you'll feel more alive standing in somebody's corner. For my personal opinion, standing in somebody's corner and training an absolute legend to then you taking it all in. And that's you kind of replacing for what your dad yeah. did for you. And I think that's where you'll feel the spark and go, do you know what? Fuck it, yeah. yeah. To have that something. Yeah. It's in your blood. You, not, you always want to fight. You can fucking maybe call somebody out when you're 60, 70. You don't know <laughs> the, 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 the way the world's uh, going. Yeah. How have you yeah. battled what, the last two, three years with like, drink, partying and stuff like that? Because now you're, is it eight months not touched a beer? Yeah, no, yeah. Sobriety, man. So uh, eight months, you. I think, um, you know, I think obviously it was tough. I lost my dad, like I said, in... in, in I was like a drink and that, you know, but um, I suppose after I lost my dad, it was just such a shock, you know, and uh, you just, you, you just fucking grief so awful thing. And somebody I was so close to, you know, it's, um, you just try to black it out, you know, you just, you know, have denial, you, all the aspects of loss. And then I just, I was, I was just fucked at the time. I mean, I'll be honest with you, it was just a massive struggle. And um, it's just the most horriblest, uh, I can't think to ever go for it. You know yourself, mate. It's an awful thing. Um, it's hard to explain to somebody who's never been through that. And just denial, just fucking drinking. You know, I suppose it got a bit out of hand. Just trying to fucking blacken it out, really. And um, I was lost, man, because he was my fucking hero. And um, like I said, my mum, she got ill and... It, I guess I lost my mum as well and um, yeah it just that was awful and I felt that um, I had a realisation that you know I've got two sons you know what I mean i got myself we do create legacy yeah, I've got my faith in God so I believe isn't even even though it was a tragedy that happened you know I, my, my boys needed me you know and I probably wasn't there for them as, as I should have been um, because I was a bit fucking lost mate like we all, we all struggled, but um, yeah, you know, turn of the year, I I decided, pretty a spiritual awakening, right? Yes. I um, decided that that was it, and um, I don't want to do to, to you know to hurt myself to do this anymore. I just want to be the best person I can be and live life. Life is beautiful, man, you know. And um, like I said, you know, just just stopped, you know, just stop, just drop drinking completely, and you know, just living a clean life, trying to. The eating habits are not that good, man. I'm still eating too much, right? So I try, I'm actually going to uh -huh. try the vegan. I've been trying to do the vegan mm -hmm. diet. Um, but yeah, I just want to, you know, um, focus on the next chapter of my life. You know, like I said, I believe in my heart. I mean, mum and dad are still here. And, um, you know, I'm very blessed to have, um, to still be here myself. I'm so blessed to have two amazing sons. You know, uh, I'm extremely proud of, you know, and um, who want to continue the box. They love it, it's in them, you know, they don't want, they do it because they want to do it. And then, they, well, come on, man, this is like you just saying just now, this is going to be the next chapter. Maybe we'll, we'll make another world champion and this will be kick on and, and keep it going because we work too hard to just let it fucking yeah. go away, man. You know, I work too hard in my life to let it go. What was that realization for you, Joe, when you're going through your dark time drinking every, was it every day you were drinking? Well, I wouldn't say every day, but I was just fucking, you know, drinking, I you know, so drink quite a bit, fucking smoking a bit of weed. And it was ridiculous. Like, you know, be too old for that shit. <laughs> Never used to do any of that. And then, but you know, it was just escapism, man. You know what I mean? It was lost, man. It's like, you just try to deal with grief, with the pain. And um, even now, I still struggle to, uh, just struggle with it. But, I suppose with sobriety, you get clarity and it hurts, but you're clear, you, you're present. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's a lot of time to reflect, think back on things. Obviously, sometimes you have regrets, but hey, you know, the past is the past. You know, to learn to live in the present and be happy. Life is beautiful. Um, not think too much of the future because fuck. You don't know what's That's on the painful you as well. Yeah, you yeah. don't know what's in the future. Like yeah. you told me in 2018, all this shit was going to happen in life. You mm -hmm. know, so many things happened. Like more than I've said, so many things happened. It's like anything can be taken away from you yeah. at any time. So 
you know, I'm just happy. Just take, I just take it one day at a time, be happy, you know, just, um, all my boys, like I said, get this gym rock and rolling. Um, who knows, man? Who knows what's around the corner? You know? Yeah, and that's the beautiful thing about life. We never know what's around the corner. Just try to enjoy the moments. We spoke about the book, The Power of Now, when we're on the phone, Joe, and you're just about to read it. So, um, I think that's for anybody watching or struggling. Like, <coughs> the pain's always still going to be there. The loss of your mum, your dad, their birthdays, their Christmases, New Year's Eve. That like, The pain's always going to be there. But you try to get, around, get rid of that pain by tanning a bottle or taking a line of gear or smoking weed, whatever the fuck it is that people do. The pain's going to be there and it's going to be a hundred times worse doing that shit. When you become clear, when you become sober, when you become clean, whatever, you see the world differently. You understand, oh, wait a minute. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. Stop self-loathing. I'm fucking Joe Kozaghi. I'm James English. I can, we can do something with our life. We can make changes, but only nobody's coming to save you, Joe. Nobody's going to chap your window and no. say, Joe, let's get your fucking finger out. <laughs> the only person that can save yourself is yourself. That's like. Correct. But when you start getting a clearer conscience, like you've got the spark back, like where you now know that you want to do something. Like life's not over, for fuck's sake. You're no. Joe Zaggy, you're 46 and oh, you're fucking undisputed champion of the world. <laughs> do you know what I mean? You're two-weight world champion. Yeah. But that just goes for anybody watching that. Even Joe Zaggy struggles. No matter who you are, no matter what you achieve in life, we all battle, we all breathe the same air. We're, yeah. all, we're all winging it to try and find something to find a sense of completion. But then when we do it, like you won in your belts, not always used Tyson Fury's prime example as well, that like won all the belts, had all the money, had all the attention, but yet had the biggest depression of his life, but yet people maybe think he should be happier, but it's not because there's no manual blueprint how we should yeah. live this life, how we should be getting through it. We kind of just grasp onto something like you doing the boxing. It's the fact that you love boxing, but it's also the fact that you are working all the time. Yeah. So it doesn't make us sit with our own thoughts. And when you start making those adjustments and changes, you feel amazing. You start feeling a, a freshness about you and a spark. Like eight months, I take my heart off to you, brother. It's amazing. Yeah, thanks, but man. This is only the beginning of your new chapter. Yeah. As simple as that. Like, see when you got the realization, right? Enough's enough. What hit you? Um, I just went away. I just went on holidays. It's uh, just just had the guts for me. Just went on holidays. Um, arguing with my girlfriend and. Uh, and fucking just being an ass, and um, he was just, um, just like uh, that was it, man. Just I had just a spiritual awakening, man. It's like I had a really good think, and now this little sit down and think that I can't go on like this. You know, I want to be a role model to my boys. Like you can tell you, your father, you can tell your boys anything, but you got to lead by example, right? Yeah. Like, and that's the way it is. You got to lead by example, and that. Um, I knew that um, going forward, I, is, I wanted to, to get fit again, healthy, fit, um, and basically come to terms with my losses, come to terms with my losses, my father, come to terms with the losses of my mum, and, um, and so I'm trying to move forward with my life and, and be happy, like at the end of the day, you know what I mean? It's like people worry about fucking money too much, you know, there's fame, and that didn't but bother me. At the end of the day, it's, um, you realize that like, you come in with the world with nothing, you leave with nothing. It was just that's it. So you can't take anything with you, man. But what you can make, do is make a blueprint, make a legacy, and 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 touch as many people as you can. And, and that's what I want to do. And whether it's been the boxing or or I don't know. Like you said, I'm 50 next year, so I'm 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 like what I am doing. I'm looking forward to the future. I don't know what the future holds, but I'm looking forward to it. I just want to be, you know, positive um, and. And just move forward and try and be happy. Yeah, you just got to be a role model, not just for yourself, but for your kids, people who's watching you. Like, your legacy is there forever. That can never be touched. That can never be touched. Like, for your kids to then see you winning world titles, going to Americans, smoking the Americans, to then seeing you maybe struggling. Like, it doesn't just, the person who's an addict or the person who's battling, everything has that effect of the people around them as well. You don't just destroy yourself, you destroy everybody else that fucking try to make you feel better. Because, when I was going through my journey, when I was I was lying after lying and partying and shagging everything, Joe, like, <laughs> everybody was to fucking blame. Everybody was to blame. It's, all, yeah, like, it's always somebody else's fault you, you, yourself. Why like, are you bringing yeah. those drugs to this party? But <laughs> nobody forces me to take lines. Nobody was forcing me to mm. gamble or place joints, um, smoke joints, but I'd done it because I was unhappy. I'd done it because I was miserable. I'd done it because I was depressed. Mm. So everybody that's battling or over drinking or overeating or taking drugs, you're depressed. 
No matter what way you look at it, you're scared no. of reality. You can't handle reality. You can't handle the pain. So I, what I see is weakness. Why? Because I was weak. Yeah. And then when you start making those adjustments and changes, you start going, fuck me. The scary thing about change, Joe, is <clears throat> when I started changing, my conscience grew. Every girl I fucked over, or every relationship, not really seeing the kids the way I should be. And your conscience grows. Then you become, because we're all sensitive beings. We know what we're doing wrong, but sometimes you just, you can't help contain yeah. yourself with doing bad shit and that's the scary part when you start doing the changes then you now we're at the stage we are clean and healthy and we are seeing the world differently now we can make the changes from now to then generate for a better future for those people around us who deserve a better life and yeah. I met one of your sons today man he's fucking great shape like I spoke to Joe a couple of times <laughs> yeah. as well on Twitter another yeah. great kid like yeah, you've, you've raised you. great sons great, like great boys yeah what else can you wish? What else do you need in life? So you're you're already winning, Joe. Yeah. You've already your your legacy lives forever. That's never going to be touched. Yeah. Your sons are fit and fucking healthy. Boom, <clears throat> life's complete. Like everything else that you do in your life is a bonus, not the dark stuff. Yeah. Because that just makes you a miserable bastard yeah, and just exactly. hate, hating life. Like what what's the plans now for Joe Kazagi for the future? You're now making adjustments to then go. Do you know what? Life's not over. Yes, I've got some loss and pain, but do you know what? That just makes you a stronger character. It yeah. does once you start dealing with it, like you don't learn the pain's always going to be there, Joe. Yeah, but what happens exactly. is you learn how to deal with it. You learn how to deal with the bullies. You learn how to become one of the best fighters ever. You learn everything's about a learning curve. Every day is a school day. Yeah. You learn, you grow, and you go, do you know what? It's pain. But you just kick on and move from it. So what's the plans now for the future, brother? Plans now, bro, is um just take a day at a time, you know. Like I said, you know, it's um this gym, I'm not gonna get back in I'm not gonna get back in the boxing, whether it's gonna be managing, uh, training, making another world champion, helping the uh, um helping kids coming through, helping kids to find because boxing is tremendous, you know, to to take people off the street. I'm waiting, man. Just uh things are gonna happen. Like I said, this gym now, the boys love it. Um, like I said, you know, um yeah, um, potentially get back into boxing. What is uh kick some ass in the exhibition <laughs> or get my ass kicked in the exhibition who cares yeah. and um or, or manage you know that's that's i had my manager's license a few years ago but dad got ill so i didn't i didn't do it um i had in the past i'd you know top fighters asked me to train them but i think the the, the thing is that boxing is my love and no matter what else I try, you know what I mean? Maybe do this and that. These boxing is always what, what's made me happy. It's made me who I am. It's given me um, a fantastic life. And I love to, um, you know, in the future, give my experiences and my knowledge onto other fighters. Yeah. Because it's still there. It's always Maybe gonna, my left yeah. hand is not as good, but I still got it up here, yeah, man. It's <laughs> always going to be there, Joe. And that's just what I'm saying. That sometimes taking that break, having your all-time highs in life, to then having your all-time lows, to then understanding, you you start appreciating life more and going, you know what? Fuck it, man. Let's go. Like, I believe you will train world-class fighters. I believe you will have titles in here from other fighters, other fighters, but that's just down to you. Once you get that spark back, you realize, yeah. fuck me, that. Like, you might even want to fucking fight again. Like Roy Jones is fucking fighting. Like, he won a world title three, four years ago, did he not? Like, he yes, won a title man. just a few years, I think 2016. That's Hopkins. Hop like, yeah. Yeah. Hopkins, Bernard, like, yeah, 16, Hopkins. Like, yeah. that's unbelievable. Like, yeah, isn't it? There's always a fight in the dog, man. Like, was there any fights, Joe, you would, you would have loved to have had? Any name over the years? Uh, do you know what? It's, um, <clears throat> people ask me that question. Like, dude, this is like... Uh, just, uh, it's, hard, it's hard to say. Obviously, Steve Collins was champion. He obviously, it would be nice to box Steve Collins. It'd be nice to fought the guys I fought when they were champions or just lost their titles. Um, but you know what? It's, it just is what I can't, I can't really complain. Nah. You know? I feel like, I, what mm -hmm. can they say? You know, I can't complain. I'm glad I signed with Mickey Dev Taylor's for, uh, for 300 pound a week. <laughs> um, I don't turn back things. I made mistakes. I have made mistakes. We all make mistakes. We're human. You know, but at the end of the day, thank God, you know, I'm, I feel blessed to be not only being able to be a world champion for as long, but to be able to share their moments with my father in the corner. You know, it's, I'm more than blessed. And it's, you know, maybe it's took a while to realize that. And I suppose um, my children are blessed. You know, I just want to be able to share the experiences I, I've had in the future, you know, but I suppose at the moment, it's all about, Getting healthy, getting fit again, losing a bit of weight. 
<laughs> and um, yeah, you know, living life. And that'll come, Joe. I, that's why I think exercise is key. Like you were at the top of your game because you were exercising every day. Once you stop exercising, now just because your boxing career's over, it doesn't mean you stop exercising because then that's when the demons kick in. That's when all the negative thoughts <laughs> kick in because you're not getting the serotonin, the endorphins, the yeah. dopamine, all the feel good factors. That cold shower before the racy fight. Though. I mean, it changed your whole mindset. Yeah. You need to get you in the cold water, Joe. I was only in there for three seconds. <laughs> <laughs> I'm such a baby. So I'm like yeah, in yeah, cold water. Three seconds takes a long way. I only jumped in the plunge pool <laughs> once in my life. I was like, I can't <laughs> walk. I jumped straight back <laughs> out, honestly. Well, one last question, my brother. For anybody watching that's maybe going through the, a struggle just now in life, what advice would you give for them? Just to, um, well, if you can't get help, just just, just read, just try to, um, it's a difficult one. <sighs> try, to not, try not to dwell on the past, you know, try not to have resentment, try not to slide, is the word, right? Um, drift. Drift. <laughs> Try not to drift. It's yeah. so easy to drift. Just um, there's always somebody out there to help. Um, and me personally is um, just living in the moment. I think we spend too much time thinking too much of the future and too much of the past. And at the end of the day, what really, what really matters right now. And um, and exercise, and eat well. Don't drink. <laughs> Do Don't <drugs>. smoke weed. <laughs> um, yeah. But Joe, for coming on today and telling your story, uh, I thoroughly enjoyed thank that. You, You're man. an absolute legend for being so open and honest about your own battles and demons. This will help a lot of people as well. But in the boxing world, your legacy will live forever. Your mum and dad will still be here. Just they'll bit your shoulder. You'll feel their presence. I know people might think that shit's weird, but you know yourself. You yeah. know that you're always here. You're always supported. You're always yeah, will be protected. But Going forward for the future, I can't wait to see what you bring, man, because I've Thank got you. a good feeling big things are going to happen. But Thank you, brother. Just keep fighting a good fight, brother, and stay strong. Thank you. God bless, God bless. you. Check out more of my podcasts on the right, and be sure to like, share, and comment your thoughts on this week's podcast. Thank you.